I grew up in Niagara Falls, New York. The winters are long. Your imagination goes crazy in the snow. And uh, you watch a lot of movies, you draw, you paint, you work on your outfits. And you, um, you, know, you start to get a, a love for this make-believe and imagination and fall in love with classic films and want to be a part of it somehow. And so I went the typical route uh, for me, which was did as much as I could acting and designing in high school, went to a community college, went to undergraduate school, and then carried it on even to graduate school at New York University. So um, what about, did, did it ever occur to you growing up in upstate New York that um, maybe you wanted to be a fashion designer? No, no, I, I, maybe there was one project in art class in ninth grade or something huh. where, but it was actually turned something historical into modern fashion. So there always was a love of, of the history of clothes, costume, mm -hmm. and uh, so, no, fashion is such a big, broad, world and you know what I do and what I really need to do my work is 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 some reason to do it some story to tell so just going back a little bit would you say would it be a fair statement to say that that you came to costume design from a real passion for movies absolutely i i i really do think that's the way it happened for me because I uh, always said, even in undergrad or graduate school, and, and at a New York University, graduate school was very much geared toward opera and dance and stage. Um, I was gonna do movies. And luckily we had the film school, the very famous film school that so many <laughs> filmmakers graduated from upstairs and I was able to go you know take part in history of art direction with William K Everson and and work with some of the fledgling design uh, directors as their designer while we were in school mm -hmm. so to fast forward a little bit um, after NYU you worked uh, you worked in shops in New York and where I want to get you to is, is that significant move to working with Richard Hornung. Mm -hmm. I, I always knew, I worked with Richard. I don't know if you know his work at all. He, many years he did the early Coen brothers, like Raising Arizona, Barton Fink, which I was lucky enough to work on. I actually met him like sizing clothes. Well, I'd actually met him when I was a shopper at Barbara Matera Limited. Uh, which was a big Broadway house. I was a shopper for a year, and he was assisting people like Pat Ziprod and mm -hmm. Santo Laquasto and things. And um, then later on, someone recommended me to size clothes, and I ended up hitting it off with him. We had a very similar sensibility. Uh, I, th I think, you know, we both came from a sort of Midwest background and took the graduate school route and um, I became their New York assistant while they were in New Orleans on Miller's Crossing and then his he moved out to LA and was designing a film called The Grifters for Stephen Frears and asked me if I wanted to come to LA for a couple of months and a, a job that I've been doing for like five years in New York a Broadway show had closed and I was at Liberty and I was like when do you want me came out here not knowing how to get around whatever, I was just doing it. And uh, about a month in, I was like, I'm moving here, this is it, <laughs> this is it. And that was September, that was fall of 89. Yeah, um, and you should just know that Richard Hornung was absolutely the Coen brothers, uh, uh, really the costume collaborator for the Coens at the time. Yeah. So he really did one film after another. Absolutely, and now and and that torch was passed to Mary Zofries, who yeah. at some point we both 
we were both assistant designers on uh, uh, Hudsucker Proxy, I think. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and and here we are today with Mary doing all their work. So just work. another split. So um, at at the point where it's it, it you left uh, Richard. Sadly, uh, Richard passed away. And what happened next? It was it was interesting timing because uh, I had gotten a call. Uh, from some a, a producer, John Lyons called me and was like, "Oh, I, I think he said Colleen Atwood might have recommended me to this first-time director, who was doing a three million dollar film in Reno, and had started up and then shut down his production, and now he was starting up again. And in the meantime, he'd lost his costume designer, and they wondered if I would come in and talk to him. And I was very ambitious at the time." Not like now? Not like, no, no. I no, rest on my laurels. No, he's not ambitious now. No. Um, okay. I just but at the time, it. I was like, new, you know, young first time director, I'm going. And I met with this kid, he was 23, his name was Paul Thomas Anderson. And he had done a short film at Sundance. We hit it off, and I was off to Reno with one person working with me, and I think I had a costume budget of like $10,000, and this was 1995. I went and did that film, it was a 24-day shoot in Reno, came back and did my last assisting job with Richard on, on Oliver Stone's Nixon. Okay. And that was Richard's last uh, film, he passed away in December, and then that following May, we were prepping Boogie Nights. So that transition from assisting to designer, blessedly, was smooth. And you know, are you happy you did all that assisting? Absolutely. I think I, uh, as an assistant designer, you know, you you get to have a front row seat of what works and what doesn't. <laughs> And uh, but you're not on the line, and uh, there are a lot of philosophies that I learned from Richard that I use every day at work. You know, thing, a thing, and catchphrases. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, use. can yeah. you name three? Yeah, I, probably two. Uh, you know, it's whether you do something a couple of times in films, uh, different films, and you know, his idea was, oh, uh, you loved it once, you'll love it again, <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> And, and I think those kind of things make it not so serious. And it, um, you know, there's also uh, the the very idea of picking your battles on what you were, what's important to take people to task about, and what's the other things. And I also think I learned there's a certain level of not having any ego. You know, I, I really am like. You know, it's your film. Like, I've put in my two cents. This is what I think should work. And, you know, either you'd like that or you wouldn't. Uh, and, and I try to, I sometimes go into damage control mode. Um, but the, the very idea that, you know, it's their film, directors will ask me things. And I'm like, you're the one who has to live with it for six months as you cut it, you know? and. And I'm fine with it. It's not. It's not said in a nasty way. It's just a real way of like. It's your film. You know, I'm there to facilitate your vision. If this is how you want it, it's rare that this happens. But um, I'm cool with it. Well, it is so true that you leave, and then the movie's made in the cutting room. Yeah, exactly. And they got to look at it. Yeah. But I sleep very well knowing that I've done. <laughs> The best I could do under the circumstances, and you know, bless you, and and go make a good movie, and I hope you're happy with it. So now that you um, you're at where you're at, uh, in terms of um, your, I I think what you're you're probably I hope you're just mid career, um, but I uh, because I want to see a. Yeah, yeah, so does Wayne. Uh, this Wayne is Wayne, my too. agent over yeah. here. Yeah. Because, uh, we both do. Yeah, because uh, I, I, ho I hope there's a lot of Mark Bridges uh, coming our way. Um, but uh, my, my feeling is um, you've worked with, when I looked at your career and I looked at um, the directors that you've worked with, 
um, you're either a recidivist or a serial killer because you have worked with the same directors over and over and over again. And you, uh, of course, the eight movies with uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, but you also did three movies with David Russell. You worked with how many times? Noah Baumbach. Twice with Noah, twice with Paul Greengrass. Right. So yeah, I do feel very fortunate that I've had been able to work with a lot of different directors and again you learn uh, how to manage that world and to give them what they need but also feel satisfied with what you're doing and that you're being creative. But the big question is really is it's a beautiful thing to work with a, one director multiple times because you have a level of trust and you've uh, crossed a, or not, not, you're looking at I, you No, I am kind of amused by that. Okay, so the, uh, um, level just of distrust? Because, um, it depends on the director. Oh, really? Well, um, let me follow that up then by saying. Did you ever hear br familiarity breeds contempt? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's okay. not Okay, uh, do you want to name names? No. No. No, I know. No, I knew you, I knew you wouldn't want to name names. No, but it's also, you know, Sometimes there's a level of trust, yeah, and sometimes there is a, a, a familiarity that, you know, feels like meddling is allowed more. Oh. And, not, and I wouldn't say it's not, it goes away from collaboration into your family so I can be nutty on you. I, <laughs> or badly behaved. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not. I, I wouldn't. I don't even know that. It's just. It's just. Sometimes it's great, and sometimes uh, it. It just all depends on the characters involved. Well, we're, of course, where I was trying to go with this politely was to say um, was to say how different are because it's all male designers, right? How just how male directors, yeah, male directors. Just how different is this group? This is a tremendously different group of personalities. So when you when you're working with Paul Greengrass or with uh, Noah Baumbach. And who are you working with now? Now you're working with Todd Phillips. Todd Phillips. Todd Phillips. This must be. How, does your approach change? And if it does change, how does it change? It's so funny you say that because I never think of them as different. Really? <laughs> yeah, because they're always the director, and I'm always the costume designer. Okay. You know, so there is a an etiquette. There is a a. a a way that I respect them and respect what they're trying to do. So, no, they may personally have different habits or be different with other crew members. What I do for them is the same, no matter what's coming from them. Like, well, wait a minute. So let me ask wait you. A wait a second. Wait a second. Because you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I know about this field a little bit. Yeah. So, um, uh, for instance, do some directors want to be in the fitting room? Do some directors have no interest at all until just say, Mark, I, uh, Mark, you're a genius. Just have that actress walk on the set. Uh, whatever. It's going to be right because I hired you. That's that. That's rare. Um, I have I have had it Just once. Asking. I have had it once. Yeah. Um, the fitting the the director in the fitting room happens maybe the first time with one or two of them. Mm. Um, and I'm like, great, it's your it's your movie. You need to be there. You need to see this. You know, it's a juggling act when you're in there because you're trying to get work done, but you're also listening to them and trying to gauge people's what's actually going on in there. So it's sometimes difficult. I don't encourage the director to come to the fittings. Um, we do pictures. He's, you know, um, I like to be able to hold back a little bit. Um, also, I'm, I do work with the actor that a director doesn't necessarily need to see. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's like how a shoe fits, because a lot of actors work from the feet up, or. Well, you have Daniel Day-Lewis. Exactly, 
Uh -huh. who on There Will Be Blood, strangely enough, if he had a problem with the shoe, it was always the left one. <laughs> it was the, we, my assistant and I would look at each other like, <laughs> okay, we'll get that fixed. Uh, um, so, you know, I don't really, I don't really love having them in there. They don't need to see it. But th then there are other times when, like I remember our first fitting for There Will Be Blood, I think it was in total eight hours with breaks and things with Daniel and Paul was there and Paul was taking pictures and I think it was good for Daniel to have Paul there since Paul wrote the film and they'd mm. been talking a lot about it. So I loved it. I get a lot of answers. I get a lot of where we're going. Um, but then there's a lot of things like, uh, you know, we talk about how pants fit or something with other actors and, and the director has bigger fish to fry, you know? So um, I, for, for the students in the room, and I, I really don't know your, um, your, uh, who you are, students, but uh, can you take us through a, Take us through a movie. Take us through Phantom Thread. And how, how do you start? How did you start on Phantom Thread? You know, working with the a, a director that wrote the piece. You know, I'm in on it quite early. I think I had the script uh, when Paul was first ready for someone to see it. And uh, you know, here here it is. Get back to me on your thoughts. Mm. <laughs> you know. And I did, and he was like, oh, that's nice. And um, nothing changed from that, but at least I knew what he was doing. And then we sit around, I'll go to his, his office, and he's got tons of books and things he's been watching, or films, or whatever. And so I absorb what he's looking at, I go away, I find my own things, maybe it could be this. Uh, uh, I remember during there will be blood. At some point, he said, uh, I, need, I need to know what my movie's going to look like. like. I've written this, but I really don't know what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. So I kind of went away and put together images like, here's the Sunday family. This is what Daniel might be as a prospector. This is what he might be as a. So and are these sketches or movies? No, boards it's actually uh, primary research, uh -huh. like from the period. Right, archival. It's research. a notebook, and I th and then go roughly in the order of the script story, mm -hmm. and I think Paul took that book to Daniel to really seal the deal mm -hmm. for there will be blood. So wow. I was really pleased with that. Um, Phantom Thread, you know, that was Paul and I got a book like that to a stage, and then we went to New York and sat down with Daniel for two days talked about what that movie was supposed to be. And then about six weeks later, the three of us went to London and, and he got, and Daniel got measured at Anderson Shepard, the Savile Row Taylor and the Shoe Man. And, and uh, we met Vicky. Uh, she came to read with Daniel. And, uh, and then we all, they went home, they were, high on Vicky and, and I was high on Anderson Shepard. Mm -hmm. And we picked fabric and, and so they went and, and, I, and uh, we didn't really have a green light, but Annapurna was willing to get one suit going mm -hmm. and a pair of shoes going or whatever. Wow. So, uh, and then we had a second fitting. And all the time we're talking about things or Paul will write me and say like, turn on TCM, you know, and I was like, I already got it on. Um, because some Leslie Howard movie was on or something that we were both referencing or a film Daniel had liked or something. And then you get there and you're, you hit the ground. Luckily I had done a film in London, uh, I'd done Jason Bourne. Mm -hmm. So I knew London a bit uh, as far as how to get around and where some sort. were. You know, when I, when I think of Phantom Thread, I think of Jason Bourne. Those things are paired very close. I try to mix it up. Yeah, I mix, I, I mix just, it up. I try to mix it up. High, low, huh? I just, it, different. Yeah. Different. Yeah. You know. I'm sorry to interrupt that's you. That's not a problem. I, you know, Paul was a bit out of his element because he'd, we'd been doing films in the Valley or in Texas. And um, now all of a sudden he's dropped in London. And I'm like telling the driver, no, turn left at Old Sturbridge Road, you know. 
And so that I felt good about that and new fabrics. And then I ended up with a great crew. Um, the one person that I met when we came and saw Vicky and Andrew Street Shepard and stuff was a, a wardrobe supervisor named Marco Scotti. And he brought on the m most incredible group of people to help, uh, help me. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we hit the ground running. I had prototype things. I had pulled things from America. We needed to go to uh, Rome. We needed to go to Paris to try to find some clothes because a lot of the clothes of that period were gone, like for higher rentals, um, for the crown. Aha, uh -huh, of course. So we, <laughs> um, we had to go all over the place to try to find I'm really to sorry, try the, to find the crown clothes. looks pretty damn good. Doesn't it? <laughs> oh, they had so yeah. much more money than I did. Yeah, yeah. The crown looks pretty damn good, I have to say that. Uh, yeah, they Jane had all Petrie. the clothes. Yeah. Um, but, and so that was a good challenge, but it also made it not look like anything else, yeah. you know? And it's interesting to go, I felt really fortunate to be able to go to these places in Rome. Uh, and, and the shoemaker in Rome. What's so exceptional, uh, exceptional about this process, as you're speaking about Phantom Thread, it seems to me, per, did, did you, I mean, you must have come to an understanding that the burden somehow of this film was on your shoulders as no, well. No, luckily I never did. No, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it was more like, um, you know, I have a job to do. You know, I had a job to do on There Will Be Blood. I had a job to do on Inherent Vice. Yeah. Um, and working with Paul is always so rewarding uh, yes. because he's a real interesting guy and kind of you're not sure where he's coming from and he is open to things and then add the layer of Daniel to it. Um, and it was a world that Daniel really knew about because mm -hmm. uh, he was raised in that society world or a level of, of men who took care of, who had clothes made for them and knew people like Woodcock. And so I, no, I tried to keep it, like I have a job to do, we have a story to tell. I do think that the idea Luckily, I'm a little out of it as far as, wow, this whole film is on my shoulders. <laughs> no, because you can get, you know, frozen with uh -huh. that, you know, like, like, uh, choke. You know? Listen, I, I wrote you a fan letter when I saw Boogie Nights. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt like Boogie Nights was just incredibly designed and it just tickles me and I just love it so much that you designed Boogie Nights and of course Inherent Vice also just looked fantastic. Thank so you. to be so nimble in terms of design and to go back and forth like this, um, that's a lot of chops, mm. you know, and the fighter. Again, it's, again though, that's why I say, you know, it's, it's how, how do we tell the story? I'm in the, I was telling you, I'm um, just in the second week of Todd's film, which is, it's been in the trade, so I can like say right, it's a like Joker right origin story. That's with what Joaquin he's working on right now. Phoenix. Jo Joker or origin. And or it's origins. not, it's like a, uh, you know, just uh, not anything superhero-y, but it, uh, it's, uh, real and I'm trying to figure out what the film is that we're making uh, you know what uh, and you always go through that period of Ooh, what are the shape of the pants what 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 kind of shoes you know what what is the outerwear like you know I usually try to find the most I, I call it extraordinary ordinary clothes um, so that they're really cool and you haven't seen them before but they're not going to take away from an actor or a scene or anything or stand out. So I'm in the process, up on ladders. Um, you know, this, I need some liniment for my arm here because we're just like a thousand pieces of clothes a day. You're looking, moving, assessing what is this, and you slowly gather and build it up, and they, these clothes become your. Uh, kind of palette in which to create this world. I'm really creating a world from 
scratch, essentially. Like, a world that wears these type of trousers. And personalities. You know. Yeah. And closets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's a great, you're creating those people. From the ground up. And even right. though it's existing things, you know, uh, it's, it has a point of view that is not random. And it has a color palette that is not random. And it's going to create a whole and a picture and a composition in every frame that has a point of view, hopefully mine, as well as my director's and DP and everything. So Mark, is there any difference? So do you have to make a dress to have it be costume design? Or can it, uh, costume design be, as you're talking about, an assembly of, of I don't know, an assembly of clothes? What, what makes a costume design? Costume design. I guess costume is clothes. Like our Turner Wilcox, mode and costume. Mm. You know, uh, that was the clothing through the ages. Yeah. So I think that would mean clothing. And, and then design is some kind of plan, some kind of uh, attitude, some kind of storytelling. It's not just there by accident. It was there, it's there by design. Yeah, well maybe the highest, maybe the highest compliment is when costume becomes clothing when it becomes somebody's closet. Okay, and I do like that because, you know, I'll slip in, you know, some choice that makes your eye go to the lead actress, yeah. but, you know, not get caught at it. Yes. And so that's where I mean, like it was planned, but uh, oh my you just take it as So close. you know what I was just thinking of? Did you, have you seen Inherent Vice? Did you see Inherent Vice? Did, like that crocheted, what was that, crocheted jumpsuit or crocheted? She wore a crocheted dress. Crocheted that was dress. Like, yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you didn't have that crocheted, did you? We, no, that I found actually in like a Hollywood uh, antique mall. Uh, I dyed it a little bit, we had Don reshape it a little bit. But uh, we tried to have one knit, how did that go? It turned out to be like my size. <laughs> so, um, gee, that wasn't going to work. Um, and, and I happened to, you know, some little costume angel on my shoulder led me to that antique mall on a Saturday. And I'm just like, oh, gee, here's a knit dress. And it turns out to be this icon for inherent vice, yes. you know. So uh, that's why I pretty much leave no stone unturned and trying to f crack it, you know. We haven't talked about actors at all. Oh. So, um, you know, I, um, what's that Jennifer Lawrence movie that you designed? Oh, A Silver Lines Playbook? That's the one. So um, I love the way that movie looked, and I adored her and everybody else in that movie. Can you tell us something about um, movie stars, working with movie stars, and working with actors? Just anything. Wow. Working with actors yeah. is like a cool uh, back and forth. Um, you know, it's like back in the theater days, you're sitting on the floor, you're looking at pictures together, you try something on, and they'll take the shape and think about it and, and suddenly start to walk differently or move differently or think about how, and I'll usually go into a fitting with an attitude of, um, I was thinking of this for the scene at the dinner, you know, and then be like, oh, I like this for the dinner, you know, because that there's dramatic things that they've been reading about. Um, and by the way, Jennifer wasn't really a movie star when we did okay. uh, Silver Lines Playbook. I'll give you that. And, or anybody. I mean, I guess Robert De Niro probably was the biggest star on that. But, uh, you know, there's a complication. I, there's a distance that I find with what I do with having to get through some of the people that s stars have around them. Yeah. Um, uh, whether it's the fact that they have three trailers in base camp or they have They have three two, trailers in base camp? Some. Some. I never knew anybody one had One for the staff, one for them. Really? And then one for their hair and makeup. Really? I yeah. never work with stars that big. Oh, 
Um, well, <laughs> you don't just swing in and be like, hey, can you try on those shoes? You know, you got to go through three or four people. Wow. At that point, I can't, you I'm know, so there are certain now. actors that I can go and knock on the door when they're done in hair and makeup and before they get dressed and be like, can you try on those shoes for Thursday? And they'll be like, yeah, sure, come on in. Or there's the stars where it's just like, um, could you ask so-and-so if they have time to maybe try on those shoes later? Okay, yeah, wait out here. So waiting outside, Albert Walski said one of his least favorite things is standing outside the trailer waiting. Okay, to... I have a story about Albert Walski. So Albert Walski, okay, this is not about me, but it's just an, a waiting story. So, okay, I'm just going to tell the story. BAFTA doesn't have to film it. On, on Bugsy, on Bugsy, I came into Western costume. Albert Wolski, who was like 103 years old and still working. <laughs> Albert Wolski was there. It was breakfast time. I said, who are you waiting for? I'm waiting for Warren. Mm. I'm waiting for Warren. And then, of course, I worked the day, and it was 6 o'clock at night. Albert's still here. I'm waiting for Warren. So waiting is part of the game. It's quite true, and um, it just makes my job. It, it sort of dilutes what we're doing a little bit. I'll bet you that if the actor knew that I, the star knew that I wanted to I do that. I believe that. I want to believe they that. They want me to come in and they want to work on their role and things. Yeah, but suddenly they get insulated yeah. in some way that makes m me be removed several steps. And so it's not, it's not that fun. I, I feel like it hinders my work. Um, I need to be able to just swing by and be like normal person to normal person uh, and just be like, can you try on those shoes? Okay, thanks. <laughs> and then you get on with your life, I get on with mine, and we know what you're wearing tomorrow. But you don't have that three trailer thing a lot. Um, no, I don't. No. It, but it, and, and because of that, it really stands out to me as like, ooh, wow. Yeah. Going forward in your in your career, you make uh, you seem to make wonderful choices. I mean, you really do. You're, I always want to see your films. I'm interested in your work, but I'm also interested in the story. Mm -hmm. um, how much control do you have over your own career? Quite how a bit, don't you think, Wayne? Um, uh, you know, as you know, there are things. Uh, you know, we spend so much time of our lives, like it's such a commitment when we do a film. You live, eat, sleep, breathe, usually leave home, sacrifice a personal life, whatever, um, to make this film. Mm -hmm. So it, it better be worth it. You know, I, if I have a couple of tests, you know, if I can't get to the first 20 pages, it's probably a no. If it's not, Usually, if it's not a film that I would go see, oh, there you go. I <laughs> usually pass. If they want, uh, you know, ancient Egypt for a buck seventy-five, <laughs> um, I usually pass <laughs> um, because it's unrealistic and it speaks about um, they set you up either for failure or, you know, Im like good luck with that. I bless you, but I can't, I can't, I'm sure I can't do that for you. So <clears throat> what we end up with mm -hmm. are the films that I say yes to. It's either good time in my life, I like the location, uh, I, I have a good gut feeling about it. Mm -hmm. um, they came up with the dough uh, on a couple of levels. Yeah. And, um, and it feels right to me too, as far as mixing up, because I, I think you, you know, you know that I try to go from one thing. I try not to get into a rut. As I, <clears throat> I think early in, in my career uh, with Boogie Nights, you know, for a while it was like I was the '70s guy, yeah. and I, I still am the '70s guy, but uh, there's. I try to mix it up in between mm -hmm. to do like uh, okay so you think of the most recent ones are like Jason Bourne, Phantom Thread, Untitled Noah Baumbach which is contemporary kind of like Woody Allen 
and then Joker origin story. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's try and before Born there was Captain Phillips or something. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're you're constantly trying something new and different and another challenge. I think <clears throat> I've been doing it long enough that you can get in a rut too. It's like, oh yeah, let's just go do some shoes. Or you can be like, this is, this is new, exciting, a new challenge. I want to figure out how to crack this story and make something look cool in a certain way. Yeah. That's why I did Jason Bourne. I'd never done an, an action film like that over and five took different you all countries. Over the world, yeah, right? five different countries. I never would have gone to Canary Islands. You know, and that was yeah. recreating Greek riots in Tenerife and how successful were we that? Or Captain Phillips, you know, doing a Somali village in Morocco. Yeah. And, and so those kind of challenges keep me interested and, and excited about getting up every day. And, and you've never designed for science fiction, not yet, have you? No, and did you notice that wasn't one of my dream projects? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I won't make you do it. Okay, thank uh, ladies you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you.